Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our podcast, Existential Ambiguity, where we're going through Wetemuni's book, Buddha's Teaching and the Ambiguity of Existence, a very important book that you don't know you need until you read it. <laughs> you know, when I was a a kid, I studied physics. And physics is one of those things that, like, you know, why are you taking physics? Why are you taking third year physics in high school? Huh. You know, well, well, I'm taking third year Latin, so I might as well take third year physics too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but I always used to wonder, how do people get through life without knowing physics? Yeah. You know, it's like... Uh, you see people, nowadays with uh, YouTube, you see these videos of people, fails, what do they call them? Fails, Fail? yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, where they they try to do something that's physically impossible, and, you know, they, <laughs> they uh, run into the limitations of the laws of physics, yeah. which, if they had known, they probably wouldn't have got themselves into that. Misjudging gravity and stuff like that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and mass and and balance and things like that. Yeah. You know, you see that all the time on those videos. And the the people are getting hurt literally because they don't understand simple laws of mechanics and physics. So <laughs> I always used to wonder, you know, because I would see people around me being surprised by simple physical things like gravity and trajectories and and balance and stuff like this and I was like well of course those that's physics so similarly after reading Buddha's uh, descriptions of our inner life and how the mind works how ontology works the science of being hmm. it's like I wonder how I ever did without it yeah or how does anybody do without it how does anybody get through the day without knowing, for example, that the sense of I is just something we cook up? Yeah. Or know the five different parts of your world, the yeah. five aggregates. Yeah. Yeah, we're personifying phenomena. Identifying with the aggregates. Right, identifying and then, and then fighting over it, hmm. struggling to preserve it. And so on. <sighs> anyway, by reading this book especially, uh, it explicates Buddha's descriptions in such a wonderful way. No one's going to look that up. Explicates. Of course they're going to look it up. I said in the about <laughs> post here that you should use your dictionary. So they're all going to look it up. Oh, of course they are. What's the difference between explicate and explain. I can't define it. Oh. That's why I'm asking. Oh, okay. Well, when you explicate something, it's like you take a simple, terse, or concise statement and you expand it ah. into something more conversational. Like talking about the sutta. That's what we're doing, yeah. Mm. We're, we're exactly doing that. We're taking Buddha's suttas and then we're reading Wetimuni's expansion, hmm. his explication of the suttas, and then we're explicating his explication. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because most people don't think in sutras. No. These days, anyway. Yeah, if you're going to think in the sutra, you need to sit with it and really chew on it. Right. Yeah. Who has time to do that? Or who takes time in anyway? Well, we take the time because we want to know this stuff. Yeah. So... To help people who are maybe in such a favorable position uh, to get the same benefit, yeah. we're explaining the explanation, explicating, <laughs> and it's a, you know a five dollar word. Yeah. 
It's on sale today for three ninety five. <laughs> so get it while it lasts. Okay. We're going to begin a new chapter in Weti Muni's book, Chapter 4. The Root Structure of the Putujana's Reflexive Experience. Now, if you didn't hear Chapter 3, you're not going to understand most of that title. <laughs> because Chapter 3 was all about reflexive experience. And the difference between reflexive experience, reflective experience, and immediate experience. And then there's also another word, the putujana. The putujana, Buddha calls him an ordinary, uninstructed person. Someone who has not heard the teaching of the Buddha, or hasn't understood the teaching properly. Hmm. Um, a putujana, it doesn't necessarily have to be a dummy. He could be a very intelligent person. Yes. He could have all kinds of doctorates and other degrees and qualifications and could be a very intelligent, natively intelligent person. But because he hasn't heard the instruction of the Buddha or he has some distorted idea of the instructions of the Buddha, um, he basically has a different kind of reflexive experience than the seka, the student, or the arhat. He has wrong view. He has wrong view, and he so therefore he suffers. Like a pair of very dark shades. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he suffers because he sets up his inner experience in such a way as to condition suffering as to produce suffering as a result. Whereas the, the Arhat is completely free of suffering. And the Seka, although he may suffer externally, does not suffer internally because he knows the uh, teaching of the Buddha accurately. Yeah. The days where he, where he remembers to load the ontology, he doesn't suffer. <laughs> right. <laughs> So what does that mean to load an ontology? Now people are going to have to look up ontology. Well, you yeah. talked about ontology earlier, so they should have looked it up already. I hope so. Ontology is one of those, another one of those words that once you look it up, you realize, wow, this is fundamental. This is like basic mm. to everything. Why don't they teach this in school? <laughs> and of course, the answer is they don't want you to know. No. They want you to remain stupid. Right. They want you to suffer. Because when you're suffering, you can easily be manipulated. Yeah. You're weak. You, you can be influenced. You can be brainwashed, in a word. When you constantly run after your senses, they just make some nice sense enjoyment for you, and then you're hooked. Yeah, because once you become engaged in sense enjoyment, your, your suffering goes up exponentially. Hmm. And then the only way you know to get out of the suffering is more sense enjoyment. Yeah. That's sort of like pouring gasoline on fire. <laughs> but if you didn't have some idea of ontology, you wouldn't be able to understand that. Uh, ontology is the science of being. And uh, in school we're taught about having, doing, thinking. And if you get to university, even knowing. They try to teach you about knowing a little bit. <laughs> but until you get to like the PhD level or postgraduate level, nobody's going to try to teach you about being. Hmm. But being is senior to all the other things. Yeah. Because if you want knowing or thinking or doing or having, you have to start from being. Huh? But in our society, in the West, uh, knowledge of being has been suppressed deliberately. Um, books on ontology aren't exactly bestsellers. It's not something you have to go through in school, you know, like Moby Dick or whatever they read these days. It should school. be, though. Yeah, of course. Because everybody is a being. Huh? Everybody is a human being. And every science, every field is an ontology. That's right. In fact, ontology, you could call it the science of sciences. Hmm. Or 
the, how you structure the functions of any system. Right. The dynamics. And we are also a system hmm. uh, internally. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the root structure of experience. The taxonomy of the put to genus reflexive experience. <laughs> yes, right, right. So let's begin. In the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, the discourse on root structure, the Buddha reveals the root structure of the reflexive experience of the Putujana, Seka, and Arhat as they result from their immediate experience of a perception. So, again, we've got all kinds of terms in this sentence that were mostly defined in the previous ish, uh, episodes of the podcast. You should go back and review those before continuing. Otherwise, you're going to miss the value that's available. You're going to miss the uh, realizations that you could get from it because you're going to have misunderstood terms. If only one term is unclear, then it's like you have one wrong number in your math equation. Yeah. It's going to end up wrong. E equals MC minus 2, right? Yeah, something like that. Oh, More no, wait a minute. That's not minus 2. It's E equals MC squared. Well, what's the difference? That gives a better result. <laughs> <laughs> E equals MC over Popsicle. <laughs> kind of works. No, nah. not really. If, if it takes one term to misunderstood to ruin an equation, well, what happens if you have two or three misunderstood terms? Then you're kind of... You can end up in deep doo-doo. Off the map completely. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, please go back and review the previous episodes if you haven't heard them. Uh, before you go on, the mula pariyaya. Mula pariyaya means root structure. Mula means root. Pariyaya means a structure, an ontology. The mula pariyaya sutta embraces all possible objects of perception, whether concrete or abstract, from earth, water, fire, and air, to oneness, manyness, even space and so on. Mm, the um, elements. Yeah. But the root structure of the reflexive experience is the same no matter what is perceived. Okay? For these three different types of people. Mm. We begin with the Putujana's case and we'll deal with the other two later. Why? Because we're all Putujana's, most of us anyway. Basically, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, if we start talking about the Arhat, it's going to seem like we're talking about some kind of alien intelligence. Mm. Um, because an Arhat sees things completely different from the Putujana. And we are all Putujanas, or we are, you know, up until very recently, <laughs> Putujanas, even if we have a lot of knowledge of spiritual things, yeah. even if we have a lot of experience of meditation and so on. The Buddha system is fundamentally different. Yeah. And that's because in the Buddha's system, we don't accept the necessity of the I. No. The self. We don't even accept external authority. It's all phenomenological. Right. We're looking at our experience. And the Buddha is giving some ideas. And then we have to find those ideas in our experience to make it meaningful. Otherwise, it's just words. Okay, so that's the difference between this kind of learning or this kind of education and the stuff we're taught in school. In school, they want you to simply believe it because it's given by authority. Whereas the Buddha, he specifically says... Don't take something as truth just because it's taught by somebody that you identify as your teacher or your guru or your authority or something like that. He says, you take the knowledge and test it yourself. And then if you find that it inclines towards good, that it gives you some benefit, then make it yours. Yeah. Otherwise, don't bother with it. So, 
in the Mulapariyaya Sutta, which is very, very long and complex, we're going to take one paragraph and we're going to describe uh, the system of the Buddha that's revealed in this sutra. Remember, a sutra is very condensed knowledge. It's very dense. And then by teasing out the meaning of this sutra, we're going to basically spend the whole rest of the chapter, which is quite long, um, understanding what's being said in this one paragraph. When the Putujana has immediate experience of, for example, the earth mode, solidity, the root structure of his reflexive experience manifests as follows. Here, monks, the uninstructed Putujana, unseeing of the noble ones, ignorant of the noble teaching, unseeing of the good men, ignorant of the good men's teaching, perceives earth, solidity, as earth. Perceiving earth as earth, he conceives earth. He conceives in earth. He conceives from earth. He conceives earth is for me. He delights in earth. Why is that? Because he has not comprehended it, I tell you. Beginning from earth, then the Buddha goes on to talk about fire, water, fire, air, space, consciousness, many, many subtle things. And, uh, but he ends all of them in the same way. Hmm. Why is that? Because he has not comprehended it. In other words, you didn't get it. You missed it. You blew it. He has a wrong view of it. He's yes. holding it in the wrong way. Right. And how is he holding it? He perceives earth as earth. In other words, he recognizes it. Mm. Well, this is earth. And he conceives earth. Conceives? What does that mean? It means he, he, he gets what it is. Yeah. Yeah. He, he gets the idea of earth. He basically gets the idea of earth. And then he conceives in earth. What does that mean? It means he projects his eye or identifies his eye, his self, with the perception of the earth. Earth is I. We'll go through this as we go through the discussion. Then he conceives from earth. He conceives his I or his self in terms of earth, yeah. the earth that he identifies with. Huh. Huh? He conceives, earth is for me. This is my earth. <laughs> <laughs> and he delights in earth. Huh? In other words, let's say, for example, somebody is buying a piece of property. Hmm. Well, first, they're going to recognize, oh, okay, this is a piece of, a piece of dirt. Hmm. This is earth. Then he projects his eye into that earth. Hmm, this would be a nice piece of earth. For yeah. me. Yeah, then the next, then from that earth he makes an I. I am the owner of this earth. Hmm. Then this earth is for me. Hmm. It's for me to enjoy. It's for me to exploit. It's Not for me for to have. Else. That's right, it's mine. <laughs> okay, and then he delights in earth. Ah, oh, this earth. Yeah. Yeah. So, why is that, the Buddha says? Because he has not comprehended it. Right? He missed. So, okay. Let's begin our detailed analysis of this statement. Because there's a lot here. It's complicated. I'm still chewing on this one. Well, the whole rest of the chapter is about this. Mm. So, we'll have a chance to thrash it all out. I've only read through it once. I, oh. I probably need to read through it five or six times. <laughs> yeah, it's and, deep. And look at it, it in my own experience also. It, this is like the calculus of consciousness. Mm. Okay? You don't just breeze through a chapter on integral calculus. You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you, you have to really sit down and gnaw on it until you like get it, you know. But once you get it, once the light goes on, it's like, oh, I can think in this new way that I never thought before, and it's so handy. Mm -hmm. I can use it for this and that and the other thing. Yeah. So the point is, we're going to give some information here, or Buddha already gave the information. Now, we're going to take it apart and really get into the details of what it means. Mm. Okay, that's our explication. <laughs> And then we're going to uh, see how this can be applied. We can analyze the above into stages as follows. One, the Putujana perceives X as X. X being whatever is perceived. Earth, water, fire, air, you name it. Perceiving X as X, in other words, he recognizes what it is, he conceives X. It's like he has an idea of X. He recognizes it, and he understands its qualities. Its functions, if it's an object, like a door. Yeah. This could be from previous experience, or it could be from an investigation of the thing itself, or it could be things that he's heard about it. Any source of information will do, but he basically understands the what the thing is, the value of it. Hmm? He conceives X. Then s step three or stage three, he conceives in X. What does he conceive? An I, hmm. a self. He identifies with X. Hmm. I'm just con a little confused cause, because step five is for me, and I thought like mine came before I. Mm, yes, it does. Where does I come from? Stage four, he conceives from X. Mm, he see? looks from X and back at himself. That's right. That's right. He projects an I from this thing this object, whatever he's being conscious of. Mm. The object of the perception. See, the, to have an object, you have to have a subject. Yeah. So conceives from X is looking back at the subject. That's right. Himself. He's looking back at himself and seeing, boy, if I had this piece of land, well, I'd be the owner, wouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so now there are two objects. That's right. Well, no, there's an object and a subject. Yeah. Yeah. Two things. Mm, two things. Yeah. So stage five, he conceives X is for me. X is mine. I own this piece of land. This is my land. This is possession. <laughs> huh? And then finally, stage six, he delights in X. He enjoys it. Mm. Okay? And because of this, what's, what's not stated here is that this begins from the desire to enjoy. Yeah. You see? That, that is the background against which all of this is going on. He has the desire to enjoy. And he, they don't, don't stay stage seven either. He suffers because of it. <laughs> right. Well, we'll get to that. We'll get, we'll, I just had we'll to, get to all of that. <laughs> okay. It's not all delights here. But what we're trying to do here is that we're trying to show the root structure of... The experience, the experience, the reflexive experience, not just any experience. Mm. The immediate experience is number one. Yeah. That he perceives X as X. Okay? This is the, the same with everybody. That's like animal consciousness. Right. The animal also knows this is something to eat, or this is something to run away from, or this is something I can use, or this is something that doesn't matter. Hmm. Okay, the animal can see that. He can recognize things for what they are and then deal with them appropriately. And, of course, people also do that. And that's called the immediate experience. But then human beings have another layer of processing that goes on called reflexive experience. Uh, where now we, we take this thing that we've perceived and we figure out how to utilize it. Okay? 
So stages two through six represent five progressive levels of explicitness in the root structure of the phenomena characterizing the Putujana's fundamental reflexive experience. Each level is more explicit than the preceding one, meaning it is more easily seen or noticed. It's very easy to notice level six. Hmm. He delights in X. Huh? We see this all the time, people delighting in things. Mm. Just turn on the TV for five minutes, and the next ad you see will show somebody delighting in whatever the product happens to be, right? Because they're trying to get you to try it too. So they want to show people delighting. Ah, yes, uh, take a puff. It's springtime. <laughs> <laughs> Springtime in the cancer ward. <laughs> so that's very explicit. That's really obvious, huh? Obvious to the uh, casual observer. Mm. But what's not so obvious are the preceding steps. Huh? Conceiving X, conceiving in X, conceiving from X, conceiving X is for me. So that's why we're going, to, we're going to go deeply into each and every one of these stages. So as mentioned above, that means in the previous chapter, the reflexive experience is a superstructure over the immediate experience. The immediate experience, not mentioned in the Sutta passage, is the Putujana perceives X. Well, just like you're saying, animal consciousness yeah. perceives it. Since the immediate experience is the foundation for the superstructure of the reflexive experience, the reflexive experience having to do with knowledge and description comes after the immediate experience of the perception. So what is that? It's this, that conditionality again. Huh? The immediate experience exists... Therefore, the reflexive experience can exist. Mm. But it says after. It, do it doesn't say that it co-arises. Well, for all practical purposes, it does. Yeah. It's, it's a very short period of very time. Very short interval. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Unless we encounter something completely unknown, mm. which we have no way to, to, to digest, no way to process, mm. which happens often. Huh? When we encounter, for example, spiritual experiences, internal experiences that we have no ontological background for, then we can't digest them. We can't process them. So we just sort of throw them out. <laughs> we just ignore them, make believe they didn't happen. Uh, or we identify them as something other than what they really are. Oh, it's just a dream. Uh, so... Anyway, the, the immediate experience is the condition for the reflexive experience. Yes. It has to be there for reflexive experience to exist. If, if there were no experience of the six sense bases, uh, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch, and the mind, then there would be no material for the reflexive experience. And, you know, no input means no output. Means sleep or death or whatever. Yeah. Unconsciousness. Yeah. So please note, he continues, that the root structure of the Putujana's reflexive experience is not what we call reflexion or self observation. It is classified as reflexive experience to the extent that there is some awareness of the immediate experience, but since there is no deliberate attention paid to it, it cannot be considered self-observation. This elementary type of root structure found in the Putujana can be experienced, sorry, can be considered the immediate experience that becomes the object of reflexive experience at the level of reflection, reflexion, sorry, with an X, in the seka, the student. So once we begin actually studying the Buddha's teaching, then we're giving deliberate attention to this process. 
We observe our experience. Yes, we experience our experience. The experience becomes the object of our experience. Yeah. Instead of the senses. Right. The Putujana is not like that. He has no inner separation between his uh, immediate experience and his reflexive experience. The whole thing is just going on automatic. Yeah. He thinks he, ought, he is the senses in the mind. Right. That changes when someone becomes a seka, when someone becomes a student of the Buddha. He begins to analyze his experience. He begins to, to, to pull it apart into its, into its constituent pieces and look at how they work together. Mm. Huh? Just like if somebody is trying to understand how a machine works. Huh? He might take it apart and watch, see how everything fits together, put it back together again, try this, try that, you know, test it in different ways, mm. and, and see how it works. Huh? Diagnose it. Yeah. Like a doctor. If someone comes to the doctor with a disease, he does different tests, you know? Looks in your eyes with the little thing, looks in your ear, huh? knocks on your elbow with the hammer. <laughs> Or whatever they do, I don't. Know. I haven't been to a doctor in so many years. <laughs> but uh, they do some kind of test to diagnose how the machine is working, mm. and from that you can figure out how it should work or how it could work. Yeah. That might be different from the way it's working when you first find it. Yeah. You know, um, you could take something like a, a lawnmower engine. You know. A lawnmower engine will do a good job of mowing a lawn, mm. you know. And if you find it in that condition, it, you can it, you can experience part of its qualities. But you can also take a lawnmower engine, put it in a go kart, mm. and putt putt around the the course, you know. Mm. So you could take the same machine and use it in a different way once you know what it does, how it works. You get my point? Yeah. So the student, the seka, he begins to take his ordinary experience, the same experience that everybody else is having, but he starts to look at it in a different way. He starts to look at it with some deliberate attention paid to the structure, the root structure of this experience. That's why we're going through all of this. That's why it's valuable. Mm. This study is preliminary to actual meditation. And the meditation is not something that you just do when you're sitting. Although sitting meditation is very good for developing concentration and for testing out different processes. But then you bring that established concentration with you out of the meditation hall. Yeah, that's the plan anyway. Mm. And you try to use that same process you learn in everyday life. And it makes such a difference. That's why it's said in the previous chapter that the seka, the, the student, even though he, he's not completely free from suffering, internally, because of his understanding of the Buddha's teaching, he doesn't suffer. Hmm. Even if externally he suffers. Huh? So we have to understand, he must be walking through life in a different way than we do. He must be walking through life with some kind of inner process that changes the quality, the fundamental root structure of his experience in such a way that it transforms, literally transforms the world that he lives in. Hmm. He's not living in the same world that we are, the putujanas of the world. Huh? He's going through life in a different way such that the things that make us suffer don't make him suffer. So, this is a very, very great benefit. Mm. Uh, if a person can be free from suffering, even internally, what to speak of externally too, then this is a very great benefit. It's just like being free from uh, any kind of conditioning. Mm. Huh? Like getting well from a disease. Yeah. Yeah, when you're, when you're in a in the hospital with a disease, the doctor says so many things are prohibited, 
huh? Can't eat this. You can't do that. You can't go anywhere. Mm. <laughs> to like, just, like a fever. It's like slows you down and you, you don't work properly. And it's like a burden. After, yeah. It's like carrying an extra weight. Yes. And then you lose that weight, and it's like ah. I feel like you're flying. I'm free. Yeah. <laughs> That's what. Then it's we like. forget about how good it feels to get well again. We get used to it. Right, and we start doing the same nonsense that got us sick. Mm. But see, the arhat doesn't do that. The arhat is forever free. <coughs> the arhat has lost the uh, the desire that leads to ignorance. Mm. He has permanently realized that this this material world, this whole thing, is not for me. Uh, the Putujana is going, this is for me, that's for me, everything's for me. Mine, mine, mine. <laughs> and then he suffers. Oh, yeah. You know, what do they say? Whoever dies with the most toys wins. Mm. Huh? No, whoever <laughs> whoever dies with the most toys suffers the most. Yeah. <laughs> Both now and after death. But the, even, we don't need to bring anything uh, mysterious into it. Even now in life, we can understand that a person with a lot of possessions, a lot of attachments, is suffering. Yeah. Huh? Look at these movie stars. They're all taking drugs, going to rehab, getting busted, you know, or getting attacked. On, Justin Bieber just got attacked on stage in Germany or somewhere uh, by some crazed fan. <laughs> you know? Why, why do all these rock stars have to have a whole squadron of security guys, you know? Everywhere they go, people are trying to hit on them for something. Yeah. You know, just because they're famous. Well, what to speak of somebody that really has a lot of resources, you know, that everywhere they go, somebody is trying to run some scam on them. Mm. It's horrible. I remember when I was a little bit famous... And I had a little bit, a few followers and this and that. It was a burden. Mm. It was a terrible burden. I'll never go through that again. You know, I'd rather just remain a, a simple monk. <laughs> yeah. But uh, even these... when, when I was a little bit opulent, I had a, like I had a mor motorcycle and I like was a little bit established. Then I had so many more things to think about. Yeah. Well, I never had like time and peace of mind yeah, always has especially a motorcycle it's always something needs fixing it's worse than a boat you know so always, always something <laughs> really wasn't all it was hyped up to be yeah. yeah yeah then the more of that stuff you have the more burden the more anxiety the more concern you have mm. so what the buddha is actually saying uh, to back off for a moment from all this detailed analysis. Uh, the Buddha is saying that give up this idea of I and mine. Stop carrying around these useless burdens. Mm. Don't manufacture more trouble for yourself. Everything extra disturbs the mind and that's, that's actually suffering. That's suffering for sure. Even so-called pleasure and success and things like that are disturbances. They disturb the, the mind. They agitate the mind. And once you taste those higher states of consciousness, why, you why don't did, want those course. Why did Michael Jackson need anesthetics to sleep? Huh? Because he was suffering like anything. He must have been. Must have been suffering like, you know, far beyond the ordinary person. To need anesthetics, man, to just to get to sleep. Oh, boy. So you really want to be famous? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, please stay with us. We're, we're out of time on this one. In fact, everyone gets a little bit longer. <laughs> but uh, stay with us, and we're going to go through all this stuff in detail and uh, make it easy to understand, hopefully. And uh, if you have any questions, post something in the comments. Huh? Don't be shy. We don't bite. At least not too hard anyway. So uh, post something in the comments and then we'll discuss it so that it's clear. Okay? See you next time.
Oh. Mm-hmm.